that down to the top 10 uh, categories in terms of units sold. And you know, that one? No, I can send that back. And so, I mean, that's that's the question, Jim. Is is that what we want to use as the baseline for product necessarily, or, or no? You know, I I think that it's a I, I think it's instructive to see what what the products are and and how many of them are products that are. Uh, you know, it, it, it gets into the weeds of making them, but it's one thing to take an edible and add a discolin into it and measure it out, and it's another thing to create a, a you know, a concentrate, a big a cartridge that is at a higher concentration or some of the other, you know, uh, concentrate-based, you know, shatters and different kinds of dads and stuff that are, I'm not an expert at it, but I do know that in the past few years, bottlenecks have had to do with, with manufacturing and production. So it, as we ramp up for an adult market, I would imagine if uh, all of a sudden there's a run on manufacturing for, for one type of product that involves you know, either a certain, uh, you have the biomass, and then you have to do the extraction, you have to do the processing, all that. We have the word that the priority will be medical, but I'm just saying the biomass is, is a good, it's, it's there, it's a, it's, I, I understand why they want to put it that way, but it doesn't really address the specific finished product. And if you're a medical patient or any kind of patient for cannabis or any product, you know that when you need a product and somebody says we can do it next week for you and you're ill, that that means nothing. Yeah. So that, you know, I, again, I, I appreciate uh, where the dispensaries are at uh, with, you know, all of it, but that's the reality of, of the commitment, you know, needs to have, we can get this product made. Uh, if we're acting as a formulary pharmacy, you know, if I go to the formulary pharmacy at Timberlane, they can usually do something within 24 hours. Uh, I'm not, again, I'm not saying I expect a than a 24 hours, but I think we have to be honest that that's, that's the, where we're at. Jim, we, have, we have a commitment, those products are, can be made in, you know, X amount of time. And yeah, I, I do understand that point. I think the biomass from the dispensary's perspective is so that they have a little bit of flexibility with what products, um, you know, they're making more of or less of that month, depending on demand. But I do see where that concern would be for a medical patient to essentially not know when you go in a dispensary what is going to be available. So let me go back and speak with the dispensaries and see if there's some way that we can incorporate these categories into that biomass. Because I, I think, um, yeah, I think we have to find a balance there. Because you're right, we don't want patients being concerned that they're not going to have what they need. Yeah, that, that's one of the challenges is the is the final product and defining that, that baseline. The, the other one is, Jim, what you probably mentioned in one of our first meetings, which is one of the goals is with with the adult use market opening up is that you want to ensure that um, not only you have that baseline, but you, you have a variety, right? Variety was the big, and so that's the other countervailing force is how do we, because medical patients should have access to that as well. Um, and hold on, I gotta let the plumber in if you'll excuse me. Just a second, if you wanna take a look at um, that list, that's what I wanted to get to uh, right after I let the plumber and let the dog out. I'll be right back. Okay. You know, I'm less worried, Meg, about the, the variety I think is gonna follow. Yeah. Uh, with, I mean that's that's more a function of the genetic lines that have been available, yeah. and uh, you know that's the hope and dream for everybody is having sort of a broad uh, variety of, of strains and whatnot. But it less so. I'm worried about that. Then, and, and I really do want to understand the you know. There's so many uh, uncertainties and the variables, you know, that would, 
prevent somebody from saying, oh yeah, I'm just going to be able to, you know, make these 10 products, you know, consistently and put them on the shelf, including, we have no idea the medical patients, you know, demand. Right. It's just, I feel like some way we have to find to acknowledge the fact that when you operate in that position of a dispensary, and it, it, it is like a formulary pharmacy, they're, you know, patients are going to ex expect some kind of quick quick response. And so whether it's the plan to be able to do that or the even starting with the acknowledgement that that's, Absolutely. you know, it's a different kind of customer. Yep. Okay. Is, what is, what are the, is the shelf life of most of these products? There's a um, pretty big variety. I mean, I, I would have to double check. My understanding is that something like edibles are only about two weeks. Um, and then, you know, flowers a little bit longer, but once again, you, you don't want it to sit in a package too long. Um, and then something like a vape cartridge could be considerably longer. So, yeah. So there's no real possibility of storage. It's pretty much on demand. I mean, limited two week storage or something like that. But. I think currently it's about a three month supply that the dispensary is aimed to have on hand just so that there is the flexibility if there's a you know demand for more, less, whatever it may be. Um, but that that's be about as far out as they could plan for, is my understanding. And that's three months of the product or three months of the ingredients to make the product? I would have to go back and ask that. I'm not sure what the um, ratio of that is. I, I think the situation that, you know, we've seen in the past couple of years, and again, it's so hard to interpret because of all the other variables that have changed with allowing home grow and things like that but you know there's been a limitation in terms of flour sometimes that should be alleviated to some degree right now there's a cap based on the number of patients and just like all of us home growers the dispensaries are growing a lot of product that you hope to have success with all of it but the best growers get different yields and things like that uh, and then when you're working with a concentrate, your yield, if it's lower in THC, you just need more biomass to create that amount of THC. So what I've seen, and this is anecdotal from my watching myself, is that the products that are, uh, you know, have value-added manufacturing beyond baking, which I think is relatively low-tech and easier to do, and you're doing it with a very generalized uh, distillate at the base of it. It's when you get into the concentrates, the things that are like hash and oils and whatnot that take uh, either a CO2 or an ice extraction or and then further processing and purification. And they're going through things that I don't even understand. You know, the, the, to make the cartridges, a very complex uh, process. Uh, that it's really quite a great, you know, product, that, that, at least that I get. So I, I know that those things aren't, you don't push a button and uh, it, literally filling cartridges by hand, you know, they're, at times were real issues. Uh, I know the adult use market's going to add technology and, you know, be able to throw money at some of those things. But the reality is, that it's going to be a bumpy ride and we don't we don't want somebody saying you know i was able to get rid of all my nerve problems with this combination of things and now that product you know isn't going to be made for two weeks not because the the biomass isn't there but you know maybe the capacity isn't there anyway we're just continuing the discussion yep. to no further you know, conclusion, but yep. I appreciate that. Thanks. Um, okay, well, and, and we'll wait to hear from, from Meg um, on the feedback she gets uh, for, for Monday. Um, okay, uh, did you both have a chance to look at the, uh, I think it's the 14 points that we've, we've come up with so far for draft recommendations? Yep. Any, um, any edits? 
to the existing ones, and then we'll see. Um, do you want me to do you want me to pull them up on the screen? Uh, sure. I did have a, a couple questions. If I may start, we'll have to clean this up. Um, the point number five, the remove the requirement that limits dispensaries to serving three people at a time. I'm assuming that that implies the um, need getting rid of the need for appointments. Right, I forgot to add appointments in there, thank you. Megan, are there privacy issues with that? I'm not opposed to it, I'm just curious. Like, uh, I thought the idea was patients might not want to know who other people, or have people know who they are. I see, so limiting the amount of people in the dispensary and ideally limiting people running into one another. Yeah, I just, I'm just curious about that. I mean, I know at a doctor's office they don't, necessarily do that you're all in a waiting room together and you get to see who's you know there but I, I, I thought that that's what that rule was intended to um, kind of address hmm. yeah I would have to look at rule specifically okay. Jim. It's never seen that way for all intents and purposes I mean initially there was you would wait out in the hallway like in Burlington so anybody in the steel building would see you sitting there. And then in the, like in Green Street, it, you know, the, the appointments would regulate how many people would be there, but if they got behind, nobody would say you can't have five people in the waiting room. And I'll, I'll be honest, I'm a little puzzled when uh, we had a witness bring it up in the, in the oversight committee a couple weeks ago about, you know, uh, the relationship between a grower, a cultivator, and a patient allowing the kind of privacy that you would need. But on the other hand, you know, I don't, I know there's a lot of questions about the stigma that unfairly goes with cannabis. And I don't know that setting up a program to have, you know, further uh, privacy requirements that HIPAA does sends the message of destigmatization. Yeah. I'm just puzzled by that. I'm not sure what, you know, so I, I, I thought we just needed a separate uh, thing that the appointments was different myself. But. Yeah, I, I would agree. I think originally it was meant to um, increase privacy, but now as what Jim's saying, it's, it, it does add to the stigma. And I, I think, and I could be wrong, I can check with the dispensaries, but my understanding is that if you would like to speak privately with a sales associate that that is an option and so okay. for people who would prefer to walk in i think um that's increasing the access in a better way and then allowing people still to perhaps make an appointment if they wish or call ahead i think is fine okay yeah th there isn't a uh there isn't a there wasn't a number requirement here in in, in arizona but uh Jim, is, is the is the registry private or is that public record? That's, uh, that's a question that uh, James Pepper might be, be able to answer. I don't know. All of the um, I would imagine it is. But. Yeah, all of the um, patient names and records are exempt from public records, so that, that you know no one in the public knows uh, who is on the registry and who's not. Um, but again, like this isn't, if there is a path for someone who does not want to, uh, you know, know or does not want to kind of be in the room with other people, I, that's all I care about. You know, like I don't have real concerns about getting rid of this. Okay, go ahead, Maggie, get some other. Um, just one more uh, point of clarification. Point number eight. Uh, lift restriction on plant count is that for patients or is that for the dispensaries? Um, I had that for I thought it was for the patients when I was drafting it but now now that you mentioned it, I wasn't sure what I had in my notes for that okay. 
But Meg, by statute, the plan, the plan counts go, the per patient plan counts for the dispensaries go away. So I think if this is a recommendation to me, the only way it makes sense would be, this would be for the patients. Okay. Right. But it, it's probably better to split it out. And because what we had talked about, I believe, was uh, a number. We had recommended, I thought, six, or was it 12, based on Maine. We had talked about at one point. I, I don't know, but this, I, I think recommending a number mm -hmm. might be better than with the restrictions. And then separating it, the, the three ounces per month, you know, right now we're at a two ounce for a 30-day period, and I think the main message coming from the group out of the discussion was to make sure that there was parity with the adult use market so that, you know, there, that there wouldn't be a situation where a medical patient was certainly being, you know, subject to something more onerous than an adult use would be, or where a medical patient has an appropriate amount of uh, product on them and it out, you know, uh, out does the, the legal daily adult use amount. That would need to be addressed. You know, if there's, uh, you can get this amount per day uh, on one visit and then a patient, you don't want to have to go back, uh, you know, every, every five days or something. You know, I can see a situation where you might want a patient to be able to uh, possess and carry more at one daily time. And I think that was what uh, Dr. Clifton had been trying to get at earlier on about 90 day supplies, things like that. But, but it's, it's really, I think, you know, we didn't want to create a situation. And I think Pepper brought this up as well, where, you know, you're going to try to help the patient and, and keep them from visiting uh, or having to visit more often, but then get them in a compromised situation in terms of bringing that product home uh, at that one time and carrying it. So parity with the, the, certainly the adult use market in terms of limitation, and we didn't, you know, we didn't fully answer the question of what happens if, you know, somebody is saying, well, right now we can only have two ounces within 30 days. So it's a moot point, but if you know somebody says, "Well, I'm going through two ounces a week, and uh, I would like to, you know, not come back for 30 days," well, all of a sudden, how do we address that? Is do we have the top limit be what adult use is? We're going to have to see where that shakes out, whether it's above the amount that it is now. So I think the recommendation is until we know that adult use limit. It really just needs to be, uh, you know, increase the home grow amount and then uh, parity with the adult view for the time being. Okay. But that's something we have to watch uh, because I, I think it does still beg to be addressed. And it's not something that we landed on letting a healthcare provider or I shouldn't say letting, asking a healthcare provider to weigh in on. They don't do that now, so. Yeah. And I would agree with Jim that if we just lift, if we just recommend to lift the restriction on plan count, um, I just, yeah, I, I think we had discussed 12, if I'm not mistaken, and I would be in support of identifying a number rather than just, yeah, unrestricted. I, I, I do remember 12 um, from our discussion. I can take a look at the minutes. Uh, but, I mean, if, if you're comfortable with that, we can put increase to 12 if you want. I believe that's what, you know, uh, when we talk to various, uh, you know, witnesses who are like Jesslyn and Dolan talking about the appropriate amount for. Uh, patient or caregiver to be able to grow and have a successful grow. Uh, and I think there was some agreement, uh, even maybe it was Virginia who agreed on that, but, you know, protecting against a failure. And then uh, the idea that somebody initially told the legislature you get a pound per plant. 
when you grow it, which is not a real thing. <laughs> you know, it, when it's dried out, maybe you get a couple ounces or something. So, okay, I'll, so I'll, I'll separate that out and, instead of lip restriction. Parity, and then I think we should say 12. If, if yeah, somebody, I'll put I mean, right that's where right in, into 12. For medical patients, that's where. Uh, I think Massachusetts was as well. I can't be sure of that, but it was. Yeah. I'll look at the minutes again, but okay, I'll, I'll put race, race limit to 12. And then my last question was whether or not we wanted to include the uh, separation or lack of separation of inventory in terms of medical and adult use until it reaches the consumer. Um, yeah, I, so I need to include that and then the issue, the, I mean, the, what we talked about last time as well was our, this subcommittee's comments and recommendations to the, um, the oversight committee um, draft as well. So those two need to be added to the list also. Uh, I, I would also, any other additions that we need to make to the list besides those two? I wasn't sure yeah. last, sorry, Jim, go ahead. Oh, no, sorry, go ahead. Last time we had spoken a little bit about lab testing, and I'm not sure if we're in the position right now to add anything to this list, but um, I did speak with the dispensaries about lab testing, and you know they completely understand just kind of the optics of why it wouldn't necessarily make sense for the dispensaries to do their own contaminant testing. The issue that they raised is, of course, the bottleneck with lab testing. Um, I think they would be open, open to integrated licenses testing other integrated license products, but I, I'm not sure that anyone is necessarily willing to make that commitment financially. Right now, my understanding is at least one dispensary does their own um, potency testing and then they send out for uh, contaminant testing, I believe, to a third party, but not as, um, but I'm not sure the details of how frequently or what exactly even they're testing, but I do know they are doing their own cannabinoid profile testing. Um, and so they would like to continue to be able to doing that on their own. Um, so I'm not sure what the recommendation would be but that was their response. Um, I think they would be open to like being tested by the state if they had a lab that was capable of doing that. But um, yeah, okay. quite a commitment. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, so there are two issues with lab testing that we discussed last time. One was what uh, I think Jim raised, with, which was, is there is there a difference between testing between medical and, and adult use? And I, I did not reach out to the lab testing subcommittee members to, to find that, uh, if they were making that distinction. I, I, I'd be surprised if they were. Uh, but then the second one was, I think what you were addressing, which was, I mean, I, I was making the recommendations. I, I don't think the, the vertically integrated licenses should be doing their own testing. And I was on, I think that's suggested. You know they can test each other if there's that bottleneck so that that's helpful um but based on the yeah response i don't know if that advances the ball <laughs> no. i might have to expect them to make you know the, the commitment to, to be able to do that uh but you know if depending on what the lab testing subcommittee comes up with um i don't know what alternatives that there are going to be um yeah, I'll do some digging and looking to Massachusetts. I believe they are facing somewhat of a similar issue with only a handful of labs. Um, I'm not sure what their medical program testing requirements are or if those labs are responsible for the medical testing, but I can look into that. That'd be great. Can, I, add that to the list. can I raise a question? Uh, go ahead, Jim. I was going to say, that, I think the discussion of testing really was uh, part and parcel as part of that, the discussion of, of seed to sale and, you know, whether 
whether there was going to be a different standard. And I do think that, you know, for people to understand that the contaminant testing versus, you know, the testing the, the uh, you know, plant chemical profile of a, of a, of a hemp or a cannabis plant are uh, different things and serve different purposes. And, you know, I think we've had a lot of discussion about it in medical oversight and really strong opinions about the need for testing. And again, this sort of puzzles me uh, from the side of cultivators in, in a similar way where they, you know, both sort of complain about the dispensaries not testing, but then don't want to be forced to test on their own. I think, you know, adult use and medical are going to be, in this case, might need to be treated differently. And I'm not sure they should be, but medical, you know, it should be tested. And, uh, it, it just like there are so many, you know, reasons uh, that it should be, should be tested. So that the idea that, uh, you know, we need to find where, where, what is the financial burden of it and where it lies. And I think, you know, that's going to be something that, as, you know, a future oversight group is going to need to get into and get witnesses and find out, you know, what is, what is the problem? Why, is, what is the cost? What would it add per ounce of, of cannabis to do it? Because, you know, I've heard people say, if it were a reasonable, you know, price, there's nobody who wouldn't want to do it. And yet I hear nobody really wanting to do it. And, and whether it's the time commitment or the, the cost of it. So I, I worry that tying the medical into the adult use testing, you know, uh, if we just hear it constantly that patients uh, uh, want the product tested and, uh, it seems reasonable and people on the oversight committee have you know made made uh, recommendations to as much so i feel like that that is you know, i don't see how we can proceed uh with the medical program without a lot of people going wow you know we're not going to change to improve the testing at all uh because i think that's perceived as one of the the major issues at least from the patient side um and that's that's all i would add to that point and i i do want to also uh mention that on the number four on this that i'm concerned that you know we're talking about uh healthcare providers disseminating information uh to increase awareness of medical programs and benefits being uh very ill defined in this and the kind of thing that, uh, and Matt, you would, I think, be able to speak to this, that I think people with concern, uh, you know, about public safety and communication are going to open their eyes and go, well, what exactly are we going to say about what, what benefits are we talking about? And so I feel like it's useful, it's been a problem that the uh, dispensaries and uh, even even the registry itself, you know, isn't able to give lots of information from people coming and looking for it. And improving visibility to the medical program, I think is important. Um, and that maybe it should be, uh, you know, worded more like that, that, you know, we want to uh, allow healthcare providers the control board, the registry, to increase awareness of the medical program, period. I don't know about saying it's benefits at this point, because as much as I know what they are and experience them, that's scientifically up for debate still, and probably just will open uh, eyes up. And then separately, I do hope that the dispensaries are able to, uh, you know, up the way they're able to, uh, disseminate studies and information and whatnot. They're restricted to a certain degree now, and I think that can change. But I, I think the intention we were looking for here was people, we need to help people know that the medical program is there. 
Yeah. Hello. Agree so, with you. Yep. So if I'm removing benefits, and uh, I should have included that in the first place for a variety yeah, of reasons. Yeah. Just increase awareness. Yeah. So I'll, I'm, I'll period it at increase awareness, and then in addition to the HCPs, I'll add allow well, HCPs in. I don't know license holders or uh, licensees to disseminate information. Well, you know, I don't think I. I think the thing the healthcare providers at this point, I'm not sure why we would say it because we we need to let the healthcare providers know through the medical it's, program. Yeah, so I, I, I. I would say we could replace healthcare providers with licensees and the state really i mean that's the licensees are currently the ones really uh, promoting the program to the healthcare providers at the moment and i think if anything we want to increase that and allow the yes. to also help good okay and then after that one of the more question here is I'm not sure. What, what, what did we mean by collect data on DMR access on number 12? Yeah, Meg, I think that was from your... Yeah, I think that was based on um, essentially wanting to look at who is currently a part of the program to determine if there are any demographics that aren't being reached. As of right now, we just don't have any data that would allow the dispensaries to say, okay, we need to, you know, maybe be more present in this community or that community, get the word out there. Um, so just getting some basic data on who's using the program, how they're finding the program, etc., I think would be incredibly useful. That none of that information is in the applications now. I don't think. I don't think you say you know, beyond your birthday. Right, and my understanding her. the dispensaries don't have access to any of the applications because that is private. So they're, once a patient determines which dispensary they're using, the only information provided to that dispensary is whatever the patient opts to provide. Um, so they may not even, you know, entirely provide the reason that they're utilizing the medical dispensary. So just, collecting as basic information as that, and then at least being able to share some of that with the dispensaries, I think is what the intention of this is. So the goal is, again, to be able to strengthen the viability of the program by using information in any, you know, appropriate way to yeah. be able to understand what the, the potential market is. Okay. I wanted to find that. I just worry if we don't say. Yeah. You know. Well, yeah, yeah. Collection? Are you looking for me? Uh, I guess. I mean, I can. Yeah, you can. I mean, you don't. Doesn't it? Don't put you yeah. on the language. Privacy. You want to sort of block right. the demographic. Right, we want to find the demographics as accessing the program, ideally their health conditions as well, um, but making sure it's specific enough that it's meaningful data, but vague enough that it is, you know, really a full patient privacy. So, right. let me... Well, yeah. Think, yeah, think about that. Yeah. The discussion to have with Lindsay, I think, as well, yeah. would have a good idea of what data is captured, you know, I think it's, it's, it's okay to have a discussion about it and then step back and go, okay, now here's the HIPAA realities or here's the, you know, whatever, but it, I think it's important enough and, and ongoing, I think the intention with the registry of being able to have a dialogue with patients and communicate, you know, hopefully we'll just make for a, a better uh, data set about who's talking to who and uh, was it and obviously all exactly. the what's working for people I mean I think it would be great if the patients were able to see okay I have 
you know, this option because I know that X percent of medical patients in Vermont are utilizing cannabis for this. I, I think that would be very meaningful. Chairman, Jim, did you say Lindsay was, is she there? Is there someone from the registry there? She's here, yes. Jim Romanoff, did you want to? Well, I, 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 you know, I think I, I, I just say I think Lindsay would be, you know, she's, she's, uh, she's uh, in, in sick with all the data and everything about the registry. She's, she's got the keeper of the information. So I just think in terms of formulating uh, what's, what's appropriate and, you know, what would be useful in the future is something that she's going to have a, a good idea about. I just, I don't know whether at this, you know, point, I'm not sure, including in the recommendations without more detail about what we want, yeah. what, what the point of it is. Whereas in, in you know, by, by even next spring or next year, when the, the registry has a new home and it's, you know, gels how it's functioning, I think then, you know, it would make sense to, to put this request out there. Uh, sure. I, I honestly think right now, just saying it in the subcommittee meeting, and uh, Lindsay hears it, and, and, and Pepper hears it, we, we all, you know, want to strengthen the viability of, of the medical program point of view of the businesses and license holders and the patients uh, you know it's a great program here in Vermont that's got a long history so we want to sure be it grow and move forward but sure. I think I just don't see putting it in now until we know what the data is it just looks like a, yep. you know there's no data that we can know of right. from anything yeah Understood. And, and let's see, if, if you wanted to comment, we're, we're all ears. Otherwise, um, yeah, I can move on to the, another question. Was, was there, did we also discuss currently, is it, do you have to, as a patient, do you have to designate one dispensary? That's correct. And so we've got to get, all that, we got to get rid of that too, right? That we voted on that. Yeah, I thought that was. It's on there. Number two. Oh, it is? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Any other? Questions, Jim or Meg, that you had, or Chairman? I I did have one. I'll defer to Meg and Jim first, of course. I, the only last comment I have is I'm still a little puzzled on six uh, allowing the healthcare providers to determine uh, which which disease and conditions that they qualify a patient participate. This is a radical shift. And I I don't remember that we decided on this just because I feel like every time I see this sentence, I'm like, well, right now the doctors decide nothing. I thought we talked about the idea of adding in uh, a vague language that wouldn't necessarily make them feel like they had to decide, but would allow them the latitude you know, like, or chronic condition that, you know, right now the language that's been put in is intractable uh, pain, I think. And intractable pain is very, any anything that causes that is left open to the healthcare provider to decide what that is. But I fear that this language that says that we're going to, you know, allow them determine which diseases and conditions, well, that's, we've let the legislature determine that up until now. Right. My understanding was that this language came from S-117 that was approved okay. by the Senate in 2020. Right. That was the discussion we had. But not by the House. Uh, yes, and I think that could have been that they didn't take it up because of uh, the pandemic. <laughs> Yeah. Well, uh, my, my comment was related to this as well. If, if this were to replace the list, I have a concern that you might actually have less access 
and more because there are a number of medical professionals, healthcare providers that are not willing to recommend cannabis because they don't know enough about it. There are no kind of longitudinal studies in the United States about its effectiveness. It's not really, and if, if you get rid of the list, and again, the healthcare provider is only attesting that you have one of those conditions, they're not actually recommending cannabis, then you might actually see the patient count decrease. So if this was gonna be a recommendation, I would want it as kind of a catch-all at the end of the list, you know, or any, or at the a healthcare professional's, you know, discretion. Um, just yeah. again, as kind of a devil's advocate on this, because I've seen this discussion play out before, is if you have that catch-all and you eliminate the three-month uh, relationship, then does that open the door for kind of the, the doctor shopping slash doc, you know, shops where um, everyone kind of just gives a 15-minute consultation and gets a medical card? And you might say, well, what's wrong with that? But I think it really does dilute the access to the people that are most vulnerable from getting the products. Um, and so I have a problem with including both of those potentially, um, both, both whatever a doctor prescribes and, get, and getting rid of the three month. And so what I would like to see also is if this allow, you know, at the doctor's discretion language does go down legislatively, which it will be a legislative decision, I would like some alternatives on the board to expand the list of qualifying conditions. And the ones that come to mind for me are if a doctor is gonna prescribe an opiate, um, they should also be allowed to prescribe, or they should be, uh, you should have access to the registry. Um, or if a person has opiate use disorder, potentially, is another one. I, I would support that because I do see what you're saying, whereas if we just take away the list, it almost takes away the guidelines and makes it a little more intimidating, perhaps, for a doctor to say that. Sure. That, that makes sense for, for it to be, I'll, I'll make it additive to, to the list. So and, it would be fun catch all. And I would also support what Chair Pepper has suggested in adding, um, you know, that if somebody is going to be prescribed opioids, that they have access to yeah. medical cannabis. I would also suggest the, you know, as another option would include anxiety and sleep disorders. So, yeah, those are so uh, heavily part of gerontology approaches uh, with cannabis. Uh, I think that, that's really uh, important. I, I would say I, I'm not sure I agree about the three-month requirement, though, in terms of doctor shopping. I mean, it, it puts a burden on a patient in terms of using the cannabis program that, you know, there's no three-month requirement to go to the doctor and have them uh, prescribe a bottle of Vicodin uh, on the same day. And so I just feel like it's uh, the three-month relationship is uh, extra, uh, you know, I, just, Jim, let me let me clarify. I don't mind getting rid of that. I just mean in combination with whatever a doctor prescribes, because uh, or what, if they're the two of those are together, you know, because if a if a doctor prescri is prescribing Vicodin after a fifteen minute consultation on a regular basis, then they will kind of get investigated. I understand what you're saying. Okay. Um, well, that that makes sense. I would say the, the flip side of it, as much as I, you know, think that it is a valid thing, obviously, to be uh, looking at uh, opiate use and, you know, the option of the uh, cannabis registry, I, I've got to say that, you know, there's, again, there's some studies, a lot of it is, is still anecdotal. I think it's Politically, it would be it would work. I think people would be enthusiastic about it, but it sort of flouts the idea of where the science has said. You know, uh, I think there's some strong science, but I just wonder about 
uh, that linkage of, of just, you know, uh, of putting that in there, whether that's something that is just, I think any doctor would be anything. If you told me we're going to prescribe cardboard for people to chew on and it'll eat them off opiates, <laughs> they might do it. But I, I know other states have done it. But it just seems like uh, uh, the same sort of slippery, their studies approach. Just, just to, sorry, I don't want to cut you off, but um, Chairman Jim, did, is there any, anyone that want to public comment before we continue? Is there public comment in the room? No. No, no, no public comment in the room. Okay. Um, I, I think, I, I did send around the public, the written public comments that were sent in, um, and I think there was another question, I don't know, if Meg or Jimmy had chance to read that about um, Maine. Uh, we're going to have to discuss that now, but I, I did want you to make sure that you read that and we can discuss that next time. Um, okay, sorry. Uh, Jimmy, you continue with your... No, no, no. Yeah. I guess I'd like to just have a comment. Um, uh, if it's some sort of a broader picture comment than a specific one, and it's really just, I mean, it's, it's clear that every one of these will assist the dispensary in being able to do their job and you know, provide patients medicine. But the bigger thing that concerns me is the lack of research about um, what works how and, and so that, that's, that's a, I just, I think that to, prescribed medicine without proper documentation is risky. Um, and just as is like variations in potency that aren't like declared is risky. So I, I, I know that this is, uh, I'm not suggesting making any changes. I'm just sort of saying that I think that we're getting into the weeds on this and kind of ignoring one of the biggest questions. Thank you, Matt. I appreciate that. Uh, in my understanding, there there is a there is a fund, right? And it, it raises a, a much bigger question, Matt, about uh, research, um, which is, I mean, I, I think someone falls under the the auspices of this subcommittee, but uh, I mean, I, I think everyone would be in agreement that you know continued research, for example, in you know Oregon, the hemp programs have advanced that. The universities actually do all the certification um, because of their all, all the resources they've developed in, into the research for for the hemp plant. Um, I, I mean, uh, maybe, maybe I'm wrong, but uh, Jim, Meg, I assume you'd be supportive of continued research for the plant and the universities um, in order to to advance what what Matt's saying in the documentation. And, research for that uh, but yeah that doesn't raise a much bigger issue I mean the dispensaries are taking on actually a pretty significant risk if they're not doing that research you know or if they're not labeling potency and someone has a psychotic break you know so it's it's it is an issue that should be looked at at some point in the process yeah, and the, the potency is that goes more more towards the testing that we were talking about earlier. But as far as you know, dedicated research towards it, you know, federally, that's been a that's been a, been a battle for more than five years. Um, but certainly, state research is possible. Uh, if if you guys want to think about making that recommendation, uh, we can certainly take that under advisement. I think part of the spirit of uh, the oversight committee recommending more funding and infrastructure for its operations was in the spirit of research somewhat along the lines of what uh, I think Meg was looking for in terms of the viability of the medical program. But I think Dr. McSherry, our vice chair, was thinking of it in terms of uh, being able to do uh, some of our own research, you know, certainly the data set would be big enough uh, and he seems interested in it. And I think our intention of being able to call witnesses in the oversight committee 
was also not just in a defensive pose uh, for oversight, but also to make sure that we are looking at the possibilities of uh, the science that is out there. And when we are at a critical mass of studies being done that we know about it and are able to uh, bring in the right people to hear about it from and then go make our case uh, for the board and uh, through that for the legislature. So that that definitely is, is uh, part of the interest. And I think a strong medical program will help the state do it credibly on a state level. I hope that's what we're going to do. Yeah. Potentially state lives to or just reduce um, the state. Jim, sorry, Jim, is that doctor? Has he explored, uh, you know, partnerships or connections with any of the Vermont universities uh, to advance that research at all? Or you know, you know, if that's been looked at. Uh, I, I can talk with him. Dr. McSherry is, uh, you know, certainly testified to various groups in Vermont uh, about medical cannabis, he's a neurologist, and he's, uh, he is interested in it, so I would, I would have, I could follow up, uh, and we can have him to one of our meetings and talk about, in the state, uh, he would be a person who might know of what is being done. It's limited, uh, if, if anything, so, but, I, mean, I think, you know, know there, there's a program at UVM right now through the nursing program I believe uh, maybe that's teaching uh, cannabis medicine and so you know I would imagine that the university would uh, always want to back up clinical work they're doing with uh, delving into research and the opportunity for that's got to be uh, got to be there and I think it would be one of those things that would increase awareness of the medical program in nothing but a good way <laughs> for everybody involved. I believe, I mean, the dispensaries are, are of course in support of research. Um, and I believe that there was legislation passed that allowed the dispensaries to give cannabis to UVM for research, but because of federal law, UVM um, wasn't able to partake. Uh, hopefully. <laughs> they need to learn some of the creative ways business is being done elsewhere <laughs> to skirt the various. That's well, not just the U.S. research either. There's research around the world. I mean, it could just start with a really good ed search on all this. <laughs> okay, good. I will. Um, I will disseminate a revised list, including uh, these we've got four new additions for everyone to take a look at uh, for Monday. Uh, anyone else have anything else to add before we adjourn? No? Yeah. Can I get a motion to adjourn? I'll let the form back in. Motion. Second. All right. Favor.